mobile tech help us to reach net zero faster, easier, and cheaper. I'm Sue Nelson. I'm a journalist and broadcaster for Boffin Media and a former BBC Science and Environment correspondent. And I'm hosting this afternoon's event in Glasgow, Scotland, adding another important perspective to the discussions going on here in the city for the United Nations Climate Change Summit, COP. 26. Thank you for joining us here in person at the University of Glasgow's rather beautiful Kelvin Gallery and those who are joining us online as well. Now the event is organised by GSMA, a membership organisation which represents the mobile industry, an industry that's been recognised by the United Nations as one of the first breakthrough sectors. The mobile industry was the first sector, for instance, to commit to the United Nations Sustainability Goals back in 2016. And one of those 17 goals is climate action. And over the next few hours, you'll be able to hear about what the mobile industry is doing from an array of impressive speakers. This afternoon includes two international panel discussions on the mobile industry's actions to reduce climate change by working towards carbon net zero by 2050 and how it's accelerating that transition, followed by a networking reception for further more informal discussions. So let's get started with a welcome by the Director General of the GSMA, Mats Granrid. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here. My name is Mats Grandard and I am the Director General of uh, GSMA. Now, you might wonder what GSMA is all about. Well, we are a, uh, an organization that uh, unifies the entire mobile ecosystem. So all mobile operators and plenty of tech providers globally. And we are trying to leverage mobile connectivity to address some of our largest societal challenges climate being one, but as you can see, we are also supporting all the 17 SDGs, so we are working tirelessly with other goals as well, but climate number 13 is, is on the agenda today. So it's my real pleasure to welcome you to, to Glasgow, and uh, we all know how big the challenge that we have in front of us. I mean, there is no doubt that the future of the planet is at stake, and many of today's headlines are very stark and very dark. But we are here today to concentrate on solutions, actions, and, and determination, which is all needed. One and a half degrees is still possible, and harnessing the potential of mobile connectivity and smart technology will help us achieve that. Now, last week here in the UK, we heard from chief scientist, uh, scientific advisor from the UK government, Sir Patrick Vallance, and he said that most of the technologies needed to shift to a greener world are already visible. And he warned against relying on this magic new technology around the corner um, uh, to solve the problem. And, and I absolutely agree with Sir Patrick. Smart technology visible and already in the works today can contribute up to 40% of the required carbon emission savings that the world needs by 2030. However, it needs to be deployed quickly and it needs to be scaled quickly. Now we have just released the research backed by the Carbon Trust, which reveals that mobile connectivity and smart technology are significantly underused by energy intensive uh, industries such as energy and manufacturing. Now let's take energy sector as an example, one of the biggest contributors to carbon emission. To achieve net zero by 2050, the carbon emissions from the global energy sector must be reduced by 50% by 2030. And almost half of that cut, 40% or 46%, I should say, could come from rollout of connected wind and solar grids. Now, this would be equivalent to a staggering four gigatons of CO2 up to 2030. Or put it another way, decommissioning that four gigatons of CO2 is equivalent to roughly 1,000 uh, coal-fired uh, plants, decommissioning of those 1,000 coal-fired plants. Manufacturing 
is another one of, of a big source of greenhouse gas emissions. And that sector also needs to have its emission uh, by 2030. For this reduction, smart factories could contribute as much as 16%, which is a sizable contribution. Now, this would mean a savings of roughly 1.4 gigatons of CO2 up to 2030, uh, or uh, put it in a different way, the manufacturing of 140 million cars. Today, connected technologies are used in only 1% of factories globally. So the opportunity is clearly enormous. Mobile connectivity is unique. It has the potential to have an enabling effect across global economy. To put that into perspective, the emissions savings from the mobile industry are up to 10 times greater than its carbon footprint. You could clearly say that we lift far much more than what we weigh. In 2018, we estimated that the mobile technology enabled a global reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of around 2 billion tons, similar to that emissions of Russia. So the potential for us to help other sectors uh, to decarbonize is huge. However, and of course, we must work on our own emissions too. And in 2019, the GSMA board set a very ambitious target for the mobile sector to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And we agreed on, on three first steps. The first one is to encourage everyone to disclose their climate footprint. And number two was to create the pathway to net zero emissions for the sector. And three, to support our members to align their targets to this new pathway. So how are we then doing? This was in 2019. So how are we doing? Well, 80% of the mobile operators uh, measured by revenue are now disclosing their carbon footprint. So that's a good starting point. And two thirds of the mobile operators by revenue are committed uh, to rapidly cutting the emissions of their whole value chain by 2030. And one third uh, have even gone further to set net zero target for the value chain by 2050 at the very, very latest. And thanks to these commitments this year, as you said, Susan, we have been recognized as the first breakthrough sector um, by the UN's Race to Zero campaign, a, an achievement that we are actually very, very proud of. But of course, setting targets is just the beginning. The challenging part is achieving them and continue to push. That's where the de determination comes in. And one of the most effective things mobile operators can do first is to switch to renewable energy. Now we're seeing more and more operators uh, aiming to use 100% renewable electricity by 2030 or earlier. Well, we can take you in the UK, three of the four mobile operators are already using 100% renewable electricity. And across Europe, Deutsche Telekom, Telia, Telefonica and Vodafone are all now 100% powered by renewable energy. Now these, there are some tailwinds helping us to switch, including rapidly dropping costs and better technologies. But there are also headwinds. And in some countries, energy policy frameworks don't support renewable energy projects. This is particularly true for our members who operate in developing parts of the world. And we're also seeing many fossil fuel subsidies, as we spoke about much recently, the, to distort the market. So our message to governments is that we cannot do this alone. We need your help. Please help our, us to decarbonize our sector by providing more support for renewable electricity. One area that is more within our own control is of course the energy efficiency of our own networks. Energy is a huge cost for us, for us uh, and our industry. And we, we estimate that we spent at least 17 billion US dollars per year on electricity. Now, due to these high costs, many operators have been running efficiency, electricity efficiency programs for years or even decades to try to reduce the consumption. Now, the good news is that 5G uh, has the ability to reduce, uh, is 90% or more efficient in providing a transfer of one bit of data than 4G or previous technologies. 
So we need to continue gathering data to better understand the energy efficiency of operators' networks around the world, where we are seeing that there are large differences between different countries. Another big challenge, probably our biggest as an industry, is how to decarbonize the entire supply chain because the majority of our emissions sit downside our direct control, both upstream from our suppliers, but also downstream uh, with our customers. And so we are encouraging our suppliers to follow in steps of mobile operators, to disclose their climate impact and to set net zero targets. We have seen incentives to customers to reuse and recycle unwanted phones. And this year, five European mobile operators came together to launch a new eco rating for smartphones. Of course, the industry is already looking to adapt uh, and remain resilient as further climate change becomes a reality. Now, networks will have to cope with higher temperatures and more extreme weather, such as floodings and fires. And mobile operators are already using the latest scientific predictions to understand where the greatest risks to their, their networks are. Now, one example of this is AT&T in the US. They need to understand the risk of hurricanes in the southeastern uh, part of the US and forest fires in the western part of the US. And they have partnered with the Argon Laboratory for climate modeling so they can adopt the right precautions for their networks. Through AI and big data, we can use mobile technology to help prepare, weather, uh, prepare for weather disasters and for pollution and environmental monitoring as well. Now, this has been a snapshot of uh, the mobile industry's climate story so far uh, to provide a starting point for, for our conversations here today. And I look forward to hearing from all of you, your esteemed speakers that will be on the panel shortly. And now the GSMA, we will continue to provide support on climate action to our members, to our suppliers, and to our partners across the mobile ecosystem. It is our aim to accelerate collaboration and progress to reach net zero by 2050 at the very, very latest. And we are convinced that we can do that best by working together. So with those words, thank you very much. Um, before, before you applaud how fantastic my speech was, uh, I, for you who maybe forgot what I said, uh, we have done a little video that will show the same thing. So please run the video. Thank you. In February 2019, the GSMA board on behalf of the mobile industry set a milestone ambition to transform the mobile industry to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050 at the latest. The scale of the problem, the world knows to be huge, but the mobile industry is leading the way, one connection at a time. Almost two thirds of mobile network companies by revenue are committed to rapidly cut emissions by 2030 and a third of the industry has gone even further, committing to net zero emissions by 2050 or earlier. Those that have taken these bold first steps should be applauded and we welcome those companies and countries yet to embark on the journey to join us. Billions of people on Earth are connected, not just by a reliance on our planet to survive, but also by the mobile networks we use. Our connected networks of people mean we can adjust, correct, and decarbonize our economies to save our future. But the impact of the mobile sector goes beyond the obvious. It connects more than just people, and this means our involvement in decarbonization can lift much more than it weighs. The greatest opportunity for the mobile industry is not in decarbonizing itself. It is in helping dozens of other industries to rapidly decarbonize through digitization. While the mobile industry is currently responsible for around 0.4% of carbon emissions globally, it enables carbon reductions in other sectors that are 10 times larger. From connected energy grids that better manage charging of electric vehicles to more effective virtual connectivity, reducing the need for physical travel, the opportunities to decarbonize through digitization seem limitless. The mobile industry is helping to secure our future by committing to net zero. Be part of the movement and discover how your business or industry can take its first steps to a sustainable future.
Visit gsma.com forward slash climate and download our infographics. Thank you, Matt Granrid, Director General of GSMA. Our first panel is called How Mobile Is Going Net Zero. Each speaker will give a short presentation followed by a discussion of the issues. And our first speaker is Dr. Paul Ryu, the Executive Vice President of SK Telecom in South Korea. Okay, thanks for your introduction. Uh, it's a great honor to be here um, to discuss our stuff and um, I'm looking forward to your you know, great feedback and the after work. Uh, before we start up, have we heard about uh, the Baduk Go match between Arpago and Isedo? There is even a very famous word left by Sedoli. Although Arpago defeated me, that doesn't mean the defeat of humanity. It was me, myself. However, from the perspective of ESG, Arpago is the loser in this match. Isedo, amount of carbon emission was only about 0.5 kilogram a day, while Arpago was more than a million times that of Isedo's. AI-based digital transformation accelerate the increase of power consumption of electronic devices, so does carbon emission. SK Telecom is one of the leading and innovative MNO in the world, with about 50% market share in Korea and 30 million subscribers. In regard to the global technology leadership, we launched the world's first 5G technology world in the nationwide in 2019. We can proudly say the SK Telecom has already secured 8 million customers for 5G with nationwide coverage. As much uh, telecommunication society is growing and developing, the consequential carbon emission problem is coming much to the force. SK Telecom is the first corporate to join RE100 in Korea is actively pursuing carbon reduction efforts to align with the global task. From the ESG perspective, reaching 48% emission reduction in 2030 and zero emission in 2050 is our ultimate goal. Moreover, 10% of revenue for social value performance and 100% corporate transparency should be accomplished. To say zero, 10, and 100% in terms of each E, S, and G. SK Telecom, as an AI and digital infra company, we are concentrated on developing and growing the 5G network, AI and digital infra, as a ESG-oriented business. We are implementing various reduction methods to increase the use of renewable energy and to optimize the network equipment and infrastructure. Not only the internal effort we have been pouring, but we also have had various social projects to generate ESG value, all together with every uh, member of society. I would like to provide the specific details in panel session. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Paul. Time now for Andy Wales, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer of the BT Group in the UK. Great, thank you very much. It's lovely to be here and to, uh, to be speaking to those online as well. Um, Matt's has done a great job, I think, of giving you the overview of the opportunity of the sector. And so let me not repeat that, but rather just give three points that I think we need as a sector to really pick up on now. So the first is to accelerate that transition to net zero across our sector, the value, the entire value chain. The second is then to accelerate how we bring new technologies and even more importantly, the new insights from those technologies to our major customers, multinationals, the public sector, states, city governments, regional governments, and accelerate internet of things and the way that emissions can be dramatically reduced in our lives. And the third is to energize and enable the consumers that we reach to see what difference they can make. So let me quickly touch on, on each of those three. So BT is the, the largest telco in the UK, um, the largest fixed network with BT and the largest mobile network here with EE as well. And then globally with our, multi our multinational business, particularly with major multinational companies and states around connectivity and particularly cybersecurity. And we've been on the net zero journey for quite some time. Uh, in 2008, we set a goal to reduce emissions by 2020 by 80%. We hit that four years early in 2016. We then set a new target, the world's third science-based target for a company to reduce emissions a further 87% by 2030, and we're well on track for that. We're 57% down now since 2016. And we're already, as Matt said, at 100% renewable power for, for the last couple of years with one of the biggest buyers of power in the UK, in fact, in the world because of that, by just under 1% of UK power, already 100% renewable. So your EE mobiles and your BT network are all renewably powered already. But the journey obviously goes significantly beyond that. Our next biggest source of emissions after electricity is our vehicles, the 33,000 vans that drive around the UK to, to fix the network, to uh, execute the transition to gigabit broadband around the country. And so we are part of a big push uh, that we initially led with the climate group and now with the UK government, with the UK electric uh, fleet coalition and now the UK electric van accelerator with the UK prime minister to really move as fast as we can in the UK to electrify transportation. And our goal is to get as many, most of our vans, if, if possible, all of them fully electrified by 2030. And then of course, beyond that, the opportunity is with our customers. And that's where the second point comes in around enabling customers to dramatically reduce emissions. And we published some research and we very much welcome the GSMA research that's just come out as well, which we thoroughly support. We published some research a few weeks ago, jointly with Accenture, the consultancy, that suggested that data will grow about eight times in the next 10 years, um, which is a good thing, right? It means we can get more out of life. It means we can enjoy uh, watching Champions League games in HD. We can enjoy playing games. We can also enjoy making our homes smarter and our cities more efficient. So data will grow dramatically, but actually energy will stay, if anything, flat, if not slightly decline because of the dramatic improvement in energy efficiency with 5G, with uh, uh, moving to you know, full, full gigabit broadband. But then even more exciting is that actually emissions will plummet. So globally, we expect emissions to go down about 40% over that period from all of that connectivity, and in the UK, even 60%. And that's because of the level of ambition and the pace and the scale of the renewables commitments and the net zero commitments that our sector is making and that, that we're executing on. And so for me, that's hugely exciting. Um, but we can do much more in terms of then how we enable our big customers around the world to get insights from new technology. So on the way here, just walking over, I walked past one of BT's new Street Hub units, Street Hub 2, which has air quality sensors in it, covering a range of uh, different air quality metrics that we provide to local authorities for free when those Street Hubs go in. We're doing it in a number of cities across the UK already. And so the insight from that can really help our customers understand how they can reduce carbon emissions, improve air quality, for their residents. And we're working through our green tech innovation platform with a whole range of different startups and scale up companies to help our customers with different types of solutions. But perhaps the most important bit and the final bit is around our consumers, citizens, our employees, the people who buy our products. And BT has 30 million consumers in the UK. And we did some research earlier in the year with an agency called Liberty that started to understand what people really thought about climate 
And we expected perhaps in the context of COVID that it might have fallen down the agenda a bit. But actually, it was a very strong third straight after physical health and mental health. People's biggest concern was the climate across all age groups, interestingly. But, there, but then what we also found was 50% of people feel disempowered about what they can do. Perhaps disempowered is a kind word, often confused, often really unsure as to whether what they can do will make any difference. And that's where the scale of opportunity we have with our brands, not just to tell people nice stories about what we're doing as an industry with renewable power and everything else, but more importantly, to enable people to think about what they can do. So we, BT, did it in a small way, launched our campaign, the Big Sofa Summit, a couple of months ago, which is to help people understand that it's not just world leaders here in Glasgow who can actually make a difference. It's people themselves at home discussing together what it is they can do in their family. And all of us need to think about how the devices we sell to people, the connectivity we enable, can actually also encourage people to take small steps every day themselves to feel confident that they too can get to net zero. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Our next speaker is Matt Pelbeck-Sharp, Head of Sustainability for Ericsson. So thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So Ericsson, we are, uh, when we talk about the value chain, we are the suppliers to, to most of the members of the SMA. So uh, while you're working on, on renew renewable energy in your uh, in your running of your networks then of course you still are over 80 percent of our total value chain emissions so for us energy performance and, and reducing energy consumption in the networks is the key element that is our biggest priority for for to working that but when we work with sustainability we have to start with ourselves and as a company we start with, with our direct emission, which is less than 1% of the total impact of the company. But still, it's the, the key part for several of the people that are looking at us and something that we can control. So we have a net zero target for our own emissions uh, by 2030. That includes business travel. So of course, we have to do carbon sinks to get there. But we are not doing that in any other way than permanent removals, which is not available yet. So we really have to look on the market and develop the market for permanent removals going forward. We are also a company that has been a bit sort of nerdy on, on, on facts. So we have been collecting data from the whole industry for, for 10, 20 years and are providing that to, to work together. So the numbers and, and, and the work that we have done together with, with, with BT and, and Orange and, and GSMA and, and a lot of the other members are really about getting the facts right and how we can develop the trajectories but also the ITU standard for, for a net zero industry. So I think that's hugely important to have the standard because we see now a lot of companies going out saying that they will be net zero by 2025, they will be net zero by 2027, they will be net zero by 2030, which is if you follow the standard and, and the science-based target initiative, virtually impossible because you have to do your whole value chain at net zero and you are only allowed to do carbon removals for 10, percent of that and if you still have any hardware it will be impossible to reach that before 2040 sometime so i think we really need to be very careful about what we promise as an industry as well because otherwise we will lose all the confidence from from other sides then if we start with ourselves and work as an industry with true facts then what can we do in other sectors? I think Mats put it perfectly. And, and we have been working with something called the Exponential Roadmap Initiative. And in fact, we have the same numbers, all of us. We have recently done another study from, from Ericsson together with McKinsey, looking at EU specifically to provide facts to the Green Deal. And we come up with the same numbers that the existing solutions can lead us to 15% reduction in total, or one third of, of the halving that we need to do to 2030. But with 5G, we can add another 5%, which leads us to the same number, the 40% coming from ICT sector. So it's, I mean, all of these studies are really pointing at the same, same fact that 40% of the needed reductions can be driven from uh, ICT solutions. But we have to start now because there are lots of solutions. And I, I'm worried about the fact that 
EU and others, they are focusing so much on the hard to abate sectors, which is very important, but they will come late. The ICT solutions really can drive exponential change fast, and we don't have time to take that long term only. We have to do the ICT solutions now, and we have to scale the existing solutions and continue to working on the innovations on 5G. So I think that those are the things that we really need to do as, as a sector to, to really get people to understand. I mean, EU to understand in the taxonomy that it's better to remove something than to improve something. And that is what we are doing. We are replacing things with our solutions and, and dematerializing sector after sector. So I think that those are some of the things that we have been pushing from Ericsson and the research that we are doing. And we are super eager to work together as an industry, as we have done on the ITU track to and, and the science-based target initiative. So let's work together on all of these things and, and also on the enablement. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Matt. And now for our final uh, speaker, Dexter Galvin, Global Director of Corporations and Supply Chains at the CDP. Hello. Um, I'm delighted to be here to represent CDP today. I'm going to quickly give you an introduction to CDP for those of you that are not familiar with us, and then help to uh, set the scene. And um, this is one of the few industry organizations that I would be very happy to come and speak to because I know that you guys are doing some phenomenal work in this space. Um, we've already heard about all of the fantastic net zero commitments, um, but let me give you a bit of the context behind that. And uh, hopefully that will set us up for some of the discussions later. Um, so CDP, formerly the Carbon Disclosure Project, um, we now are the world's environmental disclosure platform. So um, most major corporations disclose their environmental data through us. And our data now underpins this vast ecosystem of ESG data. Um, so all of the trillions of dollars of ESG cash that are floating around in the global system is actually finding its way to companies that are really performing well on their CDP disclosure. So that data and transparency underpins a whole system. Um, we started back in the early 2000s and it's built around a really simple concept, right? So initially we just sent a letter um, to large listed corporations to ask them to disclose their carbon emissions because uh, of the, and we had to say at the time, we had to say the perceived risk, climate change risk, because the investors weren't willing to acknowledge that climate change was a, an issue. Um, so, so when we started to ask companies at that stage to disclose, um, we went around, we asked some of the big banks, building societies, pension funds to support this request. Um, now we represent uh, over 110 trillion of assets under management, about 510 investor signatory organizations. So they're the world's largest pension funds, building societies, uh, asset managers, asset owners. Um, we've got a lot of sovereign wealth funds, all signatories to our request. And a number back in 2007, 2008, we started our supply chain work. And that's when I joined CDP, actually. Um, and that was to take the same idea of getting large listed corporations to disclose their carbon em emissions, but actually use the power of procurement to get large corporate supply chains to start disclosing um, their carbon emissions. And actually the ICT industry and BT Group are here, many of our uh, founding members of our supply chain work were in your industry. Um, so you were always one of the early adopters. Um, and then recently we started uh, in the run up to the Paris Agreement, we started pushing science-based targets and um, Again, BT and the wider industry were one of the first organizations to commit to science-based targets and that net zero trajectory. Um, so we have been a huge supporter of what you guys are doing. Um, we're really excited about what GSMA are doing in this space and really driving that change and driving that disclosure in the ICT space. So. Um, I think one of the biggest issues that we're going to face, um, and I think it's already been mentioned today, 
for an average company that discloses to CDP, 11.4 times their emissions are actually outside of their direct control in their supply chain. For the ICT space, that's 22 times. So we have a huge amount of work to do in your supply chains. And so that starts with data, that starts with getting organizations to measure uh, their impacts and disclosing their data in a standardized format. We need to get SMEs along the uh, uh, started on this pathway as well. And that's why the ex exponential roadmap is so important. Um, so I think this is a huge area of opportunity for us. Um, many of you guys have achieved huge reductions in your own in your own operations. Now you need to get the, those reductions out into the supply chain and uh, get your suppliers taking serious action. So excited for the discussion and uh, looking forward to what we can do today. Thank you very much, um, Dexter. And uh, we're going to move on to the topics that you've all raised in a little bit more detail. And as we've just heard from you, Dexter, it would be good to start um, with you there. Um, we heard earlier from Matt Granrid the reference to the 80% of mobile network operators by revenue disclosing to CDP. Now that's been a big increase compared with recent years. So what do you think has been driving that increase? Yeah, I, I referred to the, the trillions of um, dollars sloshing around in the ESG space. And some of it is finding its way, I mean, to, to organizations that potentially don't particularly deserve it because there's a lot of quite spurious net zero commitments out in the marketplace that aren't really backed up with uh, robust data. Um, I think one of the one of the things that's really driving it is the shift in investor focus. So the capital markets are really focusing on this. Um, I have a lot of friends in the, in the city. We have some WhatsApp groups, and uh, they they used to always say, "Dexter, your weird carbon thing," uh, <laughs> but now they're like, "Oh, we're 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 seriously we think battery storage technology is the way to go." So uh, the city has completely changed its thinking on this. They're trying to get uh, ESG specialists into all of the major financial institutions. So there's a huge shift in capital right now happening in the real economy. And it's really interesting. I think also the supply chain has had a massive impact. Since we started the supply chain program at CDP, we now work with uh, over 205 major global organizations, but that also includes the US federal government and the government of Japan. We're now engaging their suppliers on this. And the requirement of our member organizations to their suppliers has been really strict. You know, they're really starting to push um, science-based targets down the supply chain. Um, so I think there's a, a, an increasing realization that disclosure, it's kind of like your COVID pass. You can't get into events without it, right? Disclosure is like the entry point. You've got to start being transparent, got to start disclosing, and then you can go from there and set ambitious uh, reduction targets. So I think it's increasingly just the bar that organizations just need to be at. So it's a change in mindset, effectively, as well as financially lucrative. Yeah, absolutely. They'll be rewarded for it um, with more, uh, better, longer term contracts from some of their key customers. Um, they'll be rewarded from it by the financial markets who expect this sort of disclosure. Um, so yeah, it's 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 win-win. It's, it's a massive win-win, yeah. For the environment as, as well. Um, Andy, it was interesting to hear, you know, how ahead of the game BT Group has has been in this and starting early. You've already made significant cuts to carbon emissions, and in May it was announced that the BT Group had reduced it, the carbon intensity of its operations by fourteen percent over twelve months, um, which put the company on course to reach its net zero emissions um, by 2045. So that's five years ahead of um, the deadline. How did you manage to do that? Well, it's now the, the target is now actually 2030 for our own operations. We brought it forward. So you brought it forward, month, Ipo, yeah. Uh, 2040 for the whole supply chain. But 20, by 2030, we think both through renewable power 
and then through electric vehicles will have reduced the vast majority and we'll just have some re residual emissions which obviously will continue to, to try and reduce but also at that stage and that's not going to be a problem offset. really compared to no others, huh? but but so your question was then how how have we kind of achieved that i think um so a variety of things i mean obviously moving early on renewable power was was really valuable actually saved us hundreds of millions of pounds as well in power costs through through you know negotiating smart contracts becoming dramatically more energy efficient over the period um i think by having people across the entire business energized and understanding what it means so thinking about you know um for those thinking in our facilities about running the buildings we we're going through a big better workplace program moving to a whole range of new offices closing a lot of old buildings and exchanges doing that in you know in the right way with the right kind of sustainable heating systems with a huge amount of obviously focus on circular economy and recycling so i think it's about you know engaging across the whole organization getting everyone to think about how they can make a difference and then the critical point about um, supply chain which is that's the big challenge for all of us and it's where i think as a sector we probably do need to work better together because the scale of what we need to see particularly in in parts of the supply chain in parts of asia um, needs a lot of common working and common challenge. And we'll go into some of the detail about the supply chains um, in, in a moment. And, and instead of the challenges then, what would you say was the easiest um, aspect of, of the business in order to make you know, reasonable changes fairly swiftly? I think the thing, well, let me, let me answer that slightly differently. The thing that surprised me most, in, in a good way, is the pace at which... Um, the BT business faced into and has taken on the electric vehicle challenge. And I think it's because of the kind of cultural energy that's gone into the renewable energy change over the last 10 years or so. And so, you know, if you, if you look at the UK transport system, it, there's still a long way to go for it to be electrified. Um, it was only last year that the kind of mid-sized three and a half ton van became available in, in, in the right-hand drive to buy for the UK market. And yet, you know, our, our, our networks business open reach and our technology business, which also has a large fleet, um, you know, really prepared to run at the challenge. I've worked really ambitiously, um, worked with the climate group, that, you know, a really good NGO to set up the UK Electric Fleet uh, Coalition. Um, within six months of setting it up in June 2020, we had uh, 30 major UK companies in there, Tesco, Unilever, the Royal Mail. And together, interestingly, with Greenpeace, we then called on the UK government to bring forward the petrol and diesel new vehicle ban to 2030, alongside many others, and the government's done that. So I think when you've got a sector that's ambitious and energised about something, you can you can do things that even you know even seem a massive stretch. Paul SK Telecom is one of more than a thousand organisations committed to the science-based target yeah. initiative to reduce emissions in line with climate change. What made the company decide to make that commitment? Mm. Yeah, so to actively respond to the current climate crisis, uh, we are making our best effort uh, to promote SI, SBTI-based uh, carbon emission reduction in cooperation with uh, GSMA. So SBTI support companies to set the science-based target, as you might know, and boost our uh, their competitive advantage in the transition to low carbon economy. So the initiative defined uh, and promote the best practice in science-based target setting and offer resource and guidance to reduce the barriers to adoption and independently assess and approve company uh, targets. So after the commitment to uh, you know, SBTI in January, 2020, our SK Telecom established the roadmap to accomplish net zero. So based on the roadmap, we decide our carbon emission reduction goal is to reduce the amount by 48% by 2030 compared to the amount of 2020 and 61% by 2040 and ultimately to reach net zero by 2050. And which area do you think will offer the greatest reduction in emissions? I think uh, we uh, actually uh, developed the methodology and a process to uh, minimize that carbon emission by leveraging our AI based technology and also data, you know, uh, big data analysis. So I think that is potential areas we can, you know, optimize that. You know that 
heaviers. Yeah. Um, Matt, um, Ericsson is one of the founding members of the new European Green Digital Coalition that was launched earlier uh, this this year um, with an ambition to be net zero. So, how first of all, how is Ericsson defining net zero? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, the, I, uh, together with GSMA, we have worked uh, and with some of our customers really, really hard to, to create a standard way of defining this. And, and of course, it follows both the race to zero uh, standard as well as the science-based target initiative standard. And that's the new ITU standard that is recently published for, for net zero that requires, I mean, there is a hierarchy of starting by reducing, then transitioning your energy to, to renewables. Finally, the small residual part you can sort of take away in a like-for-like -like way. So there is a clear definition. And I, as, as, as we heard from SK, also the clear definition on the science-based target. I think one concern that we see is that we set very long targets but we really have to follow it up much faster. So from Ericsson's side, when we set our science-based targets as one of the first companies to do one and a half degree targets uh, in 2017, uh, before they even had the, the one and a half degree pathway. So, so they approved it afterwards when, when in 2019, when, when they launched that. Uh, we said that, that we want to have the shortest period of time. We want five-year targets and then have annual follow-up instead of putting a 10-year or, or longer targets that we cannot be held accountable to. And I think, I mean, as a company, we have signed maybe 200 pledges over the years. We are so fatigued of pledges. So we really need to work on, on concrete targets and tracking of, of, of progress. And I think that those are, are the things that will drive change in, in the bigger picture. Do you ever feel frustrated that, you know, do you feel that, well, we've been there, done that effectively because you have been leading the way here? Well, no, I, I don't feel frustrated. I think the other thing, we will talk about supply chain, but I think what we realize is that we are sitting here and we have met sort of BT and, and GSMA and, and others. It's the same companies in the room every time. It's the other 90% that are not there that we need to influence. Uh, and those are the tricky ones. And that's when we sort of realize that, that I mean, preempting the next discussion a little bit maybe, but, but that you cannot push a chain, right? You have to pull a chain. So, so uh, if you push a chain, it just falls apart. As a customer, we can sort of pull our chain on, on our suppliers, and that's where we need to work together. So that's why we're so happy to work together as an industry with our value chain and supply chains in, in a way. Uh, so I think that uh, that's how, how we see it. So no, I'm not frustrating. I rather create the coalition of the willing and work with the ones that are proactive and forward-leaning than trying to sort of fight them, my head against the ones that don't want to work with us. And effectively setting an example as well exactly. of what can be done. Yeah. yeah. Um, Paul, SK Telecom has joined the RE100 mm -hmm. campaign, a global initiative for businesses committed to 100% renewable yeah. electricity. Mm -hmm. How are you working with them? Yeah. So based on the standard scope one and scope two, so more than 99% of greenhouse gas emission uh, generated by electricity use. So SK Telecom joined RE100 initiative uh, in December 2020 um, uh, to use 100% renewable electric electricity. So contrary to the progress of major, you know, telecommunication corporate and uh, uh, in Europe and United States, uh, Korea has not yet reached grid parity. So I think this is very, uh, you know, the challenge for us. And accordingly, and the estimated uh, cost of the renewable energy 100% implementation is approximately $2 billion. And uh, it is quite huge, you know, cost burden for, for us. And uh, incorporate uh, with, uh, you know, uh, Korea uh, Electric uh, Power, Cons uh, Power, Power Co Corporation called CAPCO. SK Telecom is uh, you know, planning to expand the use of renewable energy by purchasing uh, you know, the renewable uh, green pri uh, premium pricing. And then PPA and REC, as well as the setting up the solar panels in our base station. So, uh, we expect to apply, you know, renewable energy of 
five, 65% in 2030 and 100% by 2050. So based on the 2020. So I think uh, is quite, you know, we, we have very established methodology and process and uh, I think uh, we can achieve it, you know, within that time frame. Okay. Now, Andy, you mentioned it'd be nice to expand on, you know, about your uh, 33,000 mm -hmm. vehicles because that's that's a, a lot and that's a, a big challenge. And you said to uh, reduce to uh, the emissions by 2030. So it's, it's so. What stage are you at at the moment, and what it, what are you doing there? Well, we're scaling as fast as we can. We've still only got hundreds of EVs, just as you know, almost every other company in the UK does is we're all trying to buy as fast as we can. Um, we are, there's a number of key things that the UK uh, needs to do, the government and, and major companies working together. And it, it's been codified now in this electric van accelerator that's been set up as part of the Prime Minister's Build Back Better Business Coalition. And so there's things like, you know, investments in gigafactories in the UK to ensure that we've got good access to, to battery supplies. There's the interoperability and, uh, of the charging networks and the payment systems that support the charging networks. There's obviously the, the resilience of the grid behind that as well in terms of being able to support that, um, as well as the direct supply of the vehicles themselves. And then there's a training aspect and, and a kind of education in terms of our own employees and drivers and them getting used to and being comfortable with um, switching to a different kind of vehicle, particularly because about half of that fleet, half of that 35,000, 33,000 vehicles essentially sleep outside their owner's uh, night or they're, they're our employees at night outside their homes and unless you live on a you know a nice house with a drive I don't then actually you know it's it, it can be challenging to get the infrastructure in and so the kind of UK's charging challenge is BT's charging challenges that's why we've tried to bring together so many different companies to work together on multiple aspects of it. Well Dex so let's um, return back to this issue of supply chains as and feel free everybody you know to to jump in there and make a comment as uh, as we discuss it um andy just mentioned training there effectively and i wonder you know how does cdb help companies and industries particularly uh when it comes to that challenge around supply chains um so i think you know there's a lot of talk about collaboration here uh, I think the key thing that we identified early on was that we needed a standardized approach to engaging the supply chains across all industries um, so that they would uh, talk the same language. So we have the same set, single set of um, data requirements that we can speak to suppliers with the same language and we can really drive action in the supply chain. So um, I think that that's really been the, the the main focus of the CDP approach. So we build coalitions of the willing um, and, and really get companies on board. So we started in 2008, we built up a large number of major corporations and governments all engaging with their supply chains through the same process um, and getting asking the same questions of their key suppliers and now pushing some of the key initiatives like science-based targets down the supply chain. Um, and often you, we, throughout the past decade or so, we would find a lot of industries say, no, we need to, we're completely unique. You know, our, our sector is completely unique. We, we, our challenges are completely different to any other sector. We need our own thing. Can you change your questionnaire to, to, to suit us? Um, and uh, actually, when it comes down to it, those very... The, the imagined specificity of the requirements is actually included in the quite comprehensive uh, disclosure requirements that we already uh, ask from companies. Um, so anytime I've sat down with a large corporation who said, no, no, we need these data points from our suppliers, um, you can broadly track them back to the GHG protocol standard requirements and to the CDP requirements. So uh, I think the key thing here is to speak the same language, common set of tools, um, sing single engagement mechanism, and uh, engage through standards and don't try and reinvent the wheel because we simply don't have time for any of this. You know, uh, We've been pushing commitments for many years. We're getting uh, over a thousand companies to set science-based targets. We uh, have a business ambition for 1.5 degrees. I think 960 companies have signed up for that. But now we want to see transition plans. These 2030 things are great, right? But 
we're running out of time as a society and we need to see what companies are going to do this year, next year, and the following years to actually implement these great targets. Andy? I was just going to add that, I mean, I think CDP in the last 10 years has been transformative. I mean, I think what Dexter and his colleagues have done has been fundamental. And one of the things that, that we can do together in the sector is encourage all of our suppliers to report through CDP. So we probably get, I don't know, 300 of our biggest suppliers report their data through CDP now. It would be great to have many more, and we, we encourage them to perhaps pull on the chain, as Matt's called it. But, um, but it, together as a sector, if, if that's one of the things we're thinking, what, we, what can we, we do together in the mobile sector? Encourage suppliers more rapidly to report through CDP and set science-based targets, I think is fundamental. Paul and Matt, do you have anything to add to that? I think, uh, I mean, BT in ourselves, we are part of the one and a half degree supply chain leaders, which is sort of a spin off of the exponential roadmap. It is really a non-pledge uh, because all of us are tired of the pledges. So, so it's really about setting your target, being public about it and reporting it. Uh, and I think part of it is, is also working together with the SME Climate Hub for small and medium-sized enterprises. And we need to make it easy for them. The small companies, we have to make it much more easy. And, and I think CDP is too complex for, for these small companies. We can agree on that. And I think we need to make it even easier than the easy version of, of CDP, in fact, because it, it needs to be that easy if we want them. And, and, and I think we can sort of, they want to do things, but they don't know how. And, and I think that's where, where the pooling comes in. And, and, and also, we realized when we work with, with the, the human rights aspect in the supply chain that if you don't have the competence, you cannot even do your change. You don't understand what to change. And in this case, we said, let's give them the tools from the beginning, the, the guidelines and, and the tool set. And that is really what the SME Climate Hub is all about, is really helping the suppliers meet the requirements that we can put on them. So, so sort of giving them a, a tough target, but at the same time, this is the way that you can reach it. So I think that that is something that where we could... So I encourage everybody really to join the one and a half degree supply chain leaders. You don't have to do anything but follow the rules, uh, set your own targets on the one and a half degree trajectory and then use them to help your suppliers. So it's, it's really a, a self-spinning wheel and, and you don't have to promise, you just have to do. I agree, I think uh, um, uh, an SME, a truly meaningful SME questionnaire is what's, what's needed. And so we've been working, we've developed the framework, we've been working with the exponential roadmap I think you asked the question, what are you doing to help, right? Um, I think the SME Climate Hub is a, a potentially an amazing resource for companies to access a lot of the training and support that they need to really take this action um, and to actually disclose. I remember when we started driving disclosure for the first time and these companies just really starting to get their head around the GHG protocol, we would do huge amounts of training on the ground with companies about what scope one scope to data is all about you know um so we still do a huge amount of training um it's become a little bit more sophisticated than that but um you know particularly around like net zero transition and that sort of thing but the the support has to be there particularly for the companies that are just started on this journey still very much the case in china still very much the case in india that we need to be there on the ground and help them through uh, this process um let's move on to converting existing mobile networks to 5g now that's going to involve a lot of energy consumption so let's discuss how you're going to your plans to minimize that pool what are what are they so so sk telecom you know that he has built uh, world, world's first 5g you know commercial network and uh, applying 5g service nationwide so to expand coverage we continuously expanding the 5g infrastructures uh, you know that as due to the high frequency and the small cell size of 5G. So we expect a lot of energy consumption and greenhouse gas emission per uh, device uh, to increase. So we are working on energy consumption reduction by implementing, as I said earlier, AI-based uh, power saving and applying software-defined network uh, to 5G system. So we'll closely, you know, collaborate with the global 
you know, telecommunication partners and then network equipment companies. And secondly, the, in the past, the three major um, Korea telco company uh, implement their own network infrastructure. But uh, we try to minimize the installation cost work together to also energy consumption. And we closely collaborate with, uh, with them and to set up a public network. So uh, we save at least 20% of installation cost and energy consumption. So I think that that's very beneficial for us in sharing the network. And finally, for optimizing the existing network infrastructure, uh, we phased out a 2G legacy network and also integrate 3G and 4G uh, you know, equipment by utilizing uh, single land technology. I think uh, this concept could be applied to 5G where we do need to do more research and find out solution. And all through this effort, uh, approximately 20% of to total power consumption and emission uh, will be reduced uh, this year. Great. And what yeah. about Ericsson? Yeah, I mean, we, are, we have been uh, working very close with SK yeah. Telecom on, on several of these uh, topics, and, and we have developed a model uh, that we call breaking the energy curve, where we really take a network-wide approach on on uh, how to reduce and, and as, as, as Paul said, software and, and turning off equipment that is not used is extremely important and, and doing that both on, on sort of short time as well as on, on longer time, periods of time uh, will, will save a lot of energy and, and utilizing sort of the, all, the, all the frequencies to, to, to do that. So Ericsson is developing a lot of different tools to do this on, on sort of on the radio, on, on the software. Uh, on uh, on the network wide uh, level uh, and also how to modernize the network and build them in, in a very efficient way. So we have a lot of tools and, and, and work together with customers to do that. So I think that is uh, a big part of, of what we are trying to do together with customers to, to support when it comes to the reduction of, of energy consumption in the networks. And in terms of um, the last couple of questions are going to be ones for, for all of you to, to answer. The first one really is just to sort of sum up what you see the biggest impact your organization can have in terms of climate action. Let's stop you, Matt. Uh, I think one of the coolest things that I learned, in fact, this Monday was that uh, um, the ones protecting the Sherwood forest close from here said that uh, um, 5G is saving the hoods of, of Robin Hood. So um, the, use the power of 5G to protect our forest. I think that's one example of, of sort of a nature-based sink and protecting something. It, it's just one example of, of the excitement that we see across all different, I mean, sectors of industry, how our technology can be used in a good way. So that's one example. We see it on electricity grid, we see it on, on transport, we see it on, on sort of ports and, and, and shipments, on, on logistics in general. In industry, there are so many things that we can do. And I, that is really the excitement, the power of digitalization driving an exponential change in, in society. And, and I mean, exponential, that is when you think about when will it happen and suddenly it just happened and you didn't realize it until afterwards. So think about that when you bought your last CD record, for instance. Paul? Hmm. Yeah, so we are considering impact of both transition risk and also physical risk. But uh, since the physical risk is not as large as for now, so we are going, going over the impact uh, by focusing on transition risk. So uh, to achieve the, you know, as I said earlier, RE100 and natural goal, we expect a huge uh, cost will be in occur for the purchase of renewable energy and energy efficiency improvement. In the mid to long term, uh, we, as we expect that physical risk from abnormal climate, uh, you know, uh, 
such as a wire, wild fires and typhoons uh, will gradually increase. So we plan to prepare a countermeasure to minimize the loss of asset and also customer inconvenience. Yeah. And Andy, what do you think the BT Group can do that will make the biggest impact in terms of climate action? Well, I guess, I mean, I've talked a lot about some of the things we're doing. I wanted to come back to the point Matt's made right at the start, actually, about what this, the sector being ahead of the curve, in a sense, uh, versus other sectors. And I think, I mean, if you look in the UK, you've got, you've got the work I've talked about at BT. We have some colleagues from Vodafone at the back. They've done some excellent work on Net Zero. Sky has been very ambitious. O2 are doing well. I think together we need to show beyond, the, you know, outside of the sector, what a whole sector working together and being ambitious can do. So BT has been this week and the last couple of weeks working with WWF and others calling on the UK government um, to essentially legislate and set the standard for how companies report their net zero roadmaps to really stretch beyond the risk of greenwash to be much more defensible, much more well, much better laid out, having shareholders vote on it at AGMs. So I think that the, really, the real opportunity I think now is sector, sector leadership showing other sectors uh, how they can go forward. And uh, for you, Dexter, is it, is it more that issue of ensuring that everybody goes, and as you sort of highlighted earlier, in, in the right direction with the right guidance? Yeah, I think, I think it's important to recognize that there's two different speeds in the CDP system anyway. Uh, so we've got large listed corporations that are getting A's and B's in our annual rating system um, that are doing really well and have reduced a lot of their emissions and it's the what's next for them. So for in that context, we're, we're going to be really pushing wider environmental disclosure, uh, the symbiosis between various environmental topics, but then also transition plans, particularly on climate and GHG, just as Andy was talking about, um, getting this signed off by your board, talking about what you're going to be doing between now and the next five years. And we're actually going to start reflecting that need for the transition in our scoring methodologies. So if you're one of those leading companies that's used to getting an A in the CDP system, it's going to be even harder to, to get an A. And you know, we're going to be more focused on the transition uh, in the future. However, this must not alienate the vast number of companies that are just starting out on their journey uh, around the world, uh, SMEs, but also just companies that haven't been reporting, and they need to be able to be brought along on the, on the, on the traditional CDP journey, which is measuring, managing, and reducing your impacts. And, and um, for, for first-time responders, uh, you see their emissions increase quite significantly in year one, two, and three, because they're just discovering how to measure this stuff. And they're just really understanding where their impacts are. So there's an evolution of reporting capabilities over time. And so we have to speak to those two different speeds, um, but we do have to speed the whole thing up quite rapidly, unfortunately. <laughs> and, and as an organisation, do you practice what you preach? Do you disclose your own carbon emissions? Yeah, I, I have to admit, for years we didn't. Um, and then the UK government asked us to disclose to CDP as a supplier of the UK government. Um, and, and so we were like, oh, God, how on earth are we going to do this? Um, but eventually we, 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 we now disclose every year. Um, obviously, there was a big area for us, which was um, work travel. Um, funnily enough, for a climate organization, that was our big thing. Um, and so we, we've consolidated that into one provider and we have some opportunities to reduce that. But yeah, I mean, we... We tried to lead the, um, the transition to video conferencing before um, this whole thing. And then, of course, the, the pandemic did it for us. But so, the, the, you know, you just have to look at the pandemic to see how quickly systems can actually change when they're incentivized. You know, you've got a, probably a decade's worth of transition and from, you know, physical to virtual uh, in terms of business meetings and that sort of thing that, that happened almost overnight during the pandemic. Um, 
Now, finally, we're here in, in Glasgow because it's COP26. We've got world leaders gathered here trying to find solutions to uh, the climate uh, crisis. Um, from all of you, what message would you like, if you could give one message to a policymaker, what would it be? Matt? According to the International Monetary Fund, IMF, <clears throat> globally, uh, we have subsidies to fossil fuels of $11 million every minute. $11 million per minute. So since the COP started, we have approximately uh, uh, spent as subsidies 60 billion US dollars on fossil fuels. I think we should stop subsidies to fossil fuels now, and we should start realizing that our infrastructure shouldn't be pre-taxed. We shouldn't pay a license fee. It should be a beauty contest or something. The one that builds fastest 5G should be the one awarding contracts, not 6 billion euros in, in, in Italy to build on the 3.5 gigahertz frequency. So I think we need to treat the digital infrastructure in a totally different way. So th that, those are, are sort of my main message. Stop that and push the digital infrastructure. That is really what we need to, to get from the politicians. 2030 is way too late for EU to have 5G. It should be 2025 by the latest. So I think we need to speed up immensely. Paul, your yeah. message? Yeah, so last week uh, I attended a discussion with uh, uh, you know, uh, policymakers, uh, including major congressmen in Korea. And uh, we, uh, we actually request the uh, simplifications and evolution of unnecessary regulations, uh, considering Korea uh, characteristics. And also, I uh, suggested the incentive policies uh, of the government for carbon reduction activities. And to also add the you know, previous discussion, uh, considering the situation where grid parity is not being achieved in Korea, uh, this is a really big burden for us. Uh, it's due to 50% higher price of renewable energy at this point. So I think we need the government incentive program and deregulation policy to expand the application of renewable energy by corporate. Andy, what messages would you like? Risk of, as you can see in, in all the street discussions here, a lot of the social media discussions, um, there is a huge. So, risk was, was, was very genuine about the future, was very genuine about really stepping forward into a genuine net zero world because the whole language could be kept in place. And so, I think we need to together move quite quickly to show that it's transparent, that it's properly understood. Do you think? Did you hear it? Yeah, fair enough. Okay, so so in short, um, we should legislate for and support and move rapidly to net zero, net zero tra transitions and pathways for companies that are properly understood, properly documented, properly audited, and properly approved by shareholders, so that the risk of the perception of greenwash um, doesn't get too large too quickly. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, that's a, I, I mean, that's exactly what we're, we're, we're focused on. I would say um, mandatory global, I mean, put us out of a job at CDP, right? Mandatory global comprehensive disclosure um, would be fantastic. Mandatory transition plans for listed corporations, absolutely. Um, I think ending fossil fossil fuel sub, sub, subsidy is such a no-brainer. I don't even understand why we're still talking about it, but we are. And um, for me, it's it's kind of Greta's right, you know, no more blah blah blah. It, we, it's so urgent um, that actually, I, I just before talk, coming here, I was speaking to an activist who is uh, talking about climate anxiety in the young, and uh, you know, people are 
so aware that we are so behind schedule on this thing that we're in quite a bit of trouble that we can't afford much more blah 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 well, that's a very good place to uh, end at, at this point. The uh, panel discussion uh, will finish our blah, blah, blah then. Um, thank you very much uh, to everybody and your contributions. Really fascinating. Dr. Paul Ryu, the Executive Vice President at SK Telecom, Andy Wales, Chief Sustainability Officer of the BT Group. Dexter Galvin, Global Director of Corporations and Supply Chains at CDP. And Matt Pelback sharp Head of Sustainability at Ericsson. Uh, we're going to take a break now until 1600 GMT before our second panel. And during that break, do check online for our poll, which you can find on slido.com. Um, the uh, hashtag, the code you need is 618945. That's 618945. Four, five. And there are just two questions that would be really interesting to get your opinions on. The question one is, do you think we still have a chance to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees? And it's just a yes, no, or don't know. And the second question is, we're hearing about what uh, businesses are doing today to reach net to zero. What more would you like to see from governments. So that's um, not a yes, no answer, but it'd be really interesting to hear what your suggestions are, particularly as we've heard from our panel here. So we'll reconvene at 1600. And thank you very much once again to our panel.
If you'd like to take your seats, please. Welcome to the second part of Mobile Net Zero. How can mobile tech help us reach net zero faster, easier, and cheaper? Now, before the break, we took a poll. And uh, the first question was, do you still think we have a chance to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees? Um, I'm afraid we obviously have a little bit of a pessimistic audience, um, both here and online, slightly in favor of the no vote there, 46% compared to 38% yes, but there were 15% don't knows. So hopefully by the end of this session, if we were to do that poll again, maybe uh, it might skew it uh, uh, to maybe an even 50-50 perhaps. Um, the second question was about, you know, we heard in, in the first session what businesses are doing to, to reach net zero. And at the end of that panel, all the speakers gave what they would like policymakers to do, what they thought was really important, considering we are in Glasgow during COP. 26 and we put that same question to the audience and some interesting um, answers they included um, carbon taxing carbon pricing and um, enforcing action plans um, moving away from fossil fuel subsidies which echoed what we heard from uh, Matt's and Ericsson during um, uh, the, the earlier session and acting now. So acting now came up quite, quite a bit. And again, echoing uh, one of the points made by our speakers earlier, no more blah, blah, blah. Well, our next panel is about how mobile tech is accelerating the net zero transition. And the speakers are, if you'd like to come up onto the stage, please. Um, Pekka Lundmark, the CEO of Nokia in Finland and Kelly Becker, president of the UK and Ireland zone for Schneider Electric. And the moderator for this session is the director of the Carbon Trust, Simon Ratalak. Uh, great to be here with you uh, in this beautiful city of Glasgow uh, during uh, the fortnight of, of COP. 26. Um, we've got um, two very distinguished panelists, um, uh, and we're going to kick off just by asking each of you to give a few brief opening remarks, um, starting uh, with Pekka, please. Thank you. Again, sitting or standing? You're welcome to choose. <laughs> what do you think? I'm probably going to sit and be yeah. casual, but it's up to you. Okay, I, I will sit as well. <laughs> That's that's fine. First of all, very happy to, happy to be, be be here. And obviously, the theme we are discussing is uh, is uh, absolutely uh, crucial. My my main point is actually that there is there is no green without uh, uh, digital. There is no green without uh, uh, digital. We need to start seriously digitalizing some of the heavy industries of this world. Uh, we must accelerate this digitalization. And actually, referring to the last uh, the poll that you had had, uh, what we definitely are going to need much more of is smart uh, uh, regulation. The uh, digitalization uh, is, of course, a buzzword that is used far too much and, and, and far too far too easily. But uh, when you look at what it really means, is that that so far about seventy percent of the ICT investment in the world has gone to industries that are typically considered being digital. I mean, uh, computers and uh, communications and media and, and so on. Uh, but now this is about to change. That in the future, in the next 10 to 20 years, 
we estimate that actually 70% of investment will go to physical industries, digitalization investments. And, and uh, there is a massive potential and there's no way we could achieve anywhere near any net zero or any other blah, blah, blahs uh, unless we seriously digitalize physical uh, industries. And when I talk about physical industries, of course, it covers manufacturing and uh, transportation and mining and um, power plants and so on. But it also covers farming. And, and farming was actually the example I wanted to, wanted to mention here. But because uh, if you, we have made a, recently a study that if you put 15 to 20% of all farms would start using the digital technology that is today available, we would see globally an increase in yields of 300 million tons each year, reduction in costs of billion, hundreds of billions of dollars, reduced waste and so on. And remembering that the food systems are represent, rep, re, responsible for 20 to 30 percent of greenhouse, has, greenhouse gas emissions and 70 percent of the biodiversity loss. It means that smart agriculture is one key area of digitalization which uh, we should uh, uh, not uh, forget. So currently only 30 percent of world's economy is digitalized. We need to digitalize the 70 percent if we want to go uh, green. This requires a lot of partnerships. It requires partnerships mm. between the likes of uh, Nokia uh, with uh, energy companies. Uh, Schneider, of course, is, is part of the equation as well. Partnerships across the value uh, chain, the physical industries will not be able to digitalize alone. And then the third and final, final point, um, uh, we really need to think hard globally that how we create an incentive framework that uh, attracts in the most efficient way private investment into this because um, this is going to be a massively expensive uh, task. Trillions and trillions and trillions will be needed and there is simply no way this money could be available or made, could be made available through public budgets or taxpayers money. The only way is that we create an incentive structure for public money to invest and it needs to be simple and market based and uh, my clear favorite is the European ETS system, the carbon trading system, which uh, it's a perfect uh, market. You cap the emissions, you reduce the amount of emissions that are allowed every year and you make the market, uh, market forces compete about uh, who is willing to pay uh, for the entire, all the time reducing amount of allowed um, emissions. Something and, and this system covers about 50% of the European emissions. So expanding that system to other sectors which are not covered yet, and then creating a global system that would cover a reasonably big part of the world would, from my point of view, be by far the most important regulatory action that, uh, that should, be, uh, should be done. No green without digital. That's a good slogan. Uh, Pekka, thank you very, very much. Hopefully we'll return to some of those themes during the course of the, the discussion. Um, Kelly, we'd love to hear your opening remarks, please, next. Sure. So Schneider Electric has been on a at least 15 year journey in terms of driving green and net carbonization and um, both with our own facilities, but as well with all of our customers and, and people we work with, as well as with governments. And so you know, the opportunity to be a cop and actually really talk about what is everybody trying to do together. You know, I agree with Pekka. I think there's a strong combination between private and public. And, and how is that ultimately going to work together to really drive and solve the world's problems? Um, Schneider Electric works in just about every industry you could imagine from, you know, breakers in your homes to the data centers that Pekka probably has to commercial buildings all the way up to the grid. Um, and so we think there are opportunities now to solve within all of these parts of um, all these different segments and all of these places in which we're active. Um, but we have to act now. And we think the opportunity um, like never before is to use digital and data and actually electricity much more to really push us forward and, and help hit goals. So certainly excited to talk about more of these things with with you and Pekka while we're here. Wonderful, we are too. Um, that's great. I'm going to start with a question that relates to the poll that oh. we heard um, uh, just now from Sue. Um, people out there seem a little pessimistic when it comes to the 
the, the, the likelihood of us being able to hit that 1.5 degrees C target. What's your view? Um, it's a tough one, perhaps, to put you on the spot on, but Kelly, what, what, what's your gut at this point when it comes to that big question? I think we can hit it, um, but I think it's going to take everybody addressing their own um, component of, of sort of the cycle that we're in. Um, you know, no doubt the scientists have done all the work to tell us that, that this needs to happen. And so how do we actually do this today? The technology exists, um, both from energy efficiency and things that you actually use to solve buildings, all the way through the digital infrastructure to drive that. Um, you know, we're big believers that actually just using less is, is really where you ultimately start. You know, we talk about solar panels a lot and electric vehicles and, and all of these things that ultimately are using um, electricity and energy in a different way. But really, let's just use less. And there's technologies throughout all of the supply chains and throughout every segment I mentioned um, that helps companies do that and helps governments and individuals do that. And so now's really the time. Um, I don't think we can wait any longer. And that's, I think, pretty well understood. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and, and Pekka, what's your view on that, that question? Of one point five? <clears throat> well, I certainly agree that we can't wait any longer. But uh, unfortunately, when you look at the facts, the world has already won between 1 and 1.2 degrees, something, something like that. In order to reach that 1.5, we should have our global emissions during 2020s half them in, again in the 30s and once again in the 40s. Mm. Uh, right now, they are still increasing, mm. not as fast as before, but they are still increasing mm. and we should have them uh, in the next uh, uh, eight to nine mm. years. Uh, I just uh, don't see it uh, happening. Yes, there is a massive hurry and uh, uh, most of the technologies start to be there. Uh, yes, but uh, then there are still big issues to be solved and, and storage is, is clearly one of the biggest. We need to get to uh, scalable, uh, economically viable, uh, mm. most likely hydrogen mm -hmm. as a storage. Um, and, and we need to get there, <coughs> get there very, very quickly. So technology will be the central part and, and the only, only kind of mm. answer that there mm. will be but uh, more inventions will still, innovation will still be needed. The clock is clearly ticking. Um, uh, smart energy technologies have to be a key part of, of the, the solution to, to get there in time. Kelly, we hear a lot about the term smart energy systems. Um, and I know Schneider Electric uses the term electricity 4.0 too. Perhaps we could start with some definitions what do those terms mean for you? So electricity 4.0 really means uh, more electricity and more digital. And ultimately, how do we use those things together to solve the world's problems and to drive decarbonization? It's sort of as simple as that. You know, I think when we talk about energy, um, you know, ultimately it's about how do we reduce energy? And, and as we were sort of discussing before, how do you use the data that exists today to help make decisions? Um, I think there's a lot of things dependent on the type of business you are or as an individual to look at the data and make a decision about what can you do? Where do you start? And I think we get asked a lot by clients, um, how, how do I even start? You know, we know in the UK, as an example, 70% of buildings haven't even really started. Um, and so pretty regularly it goes, stop, assess where you are, let's look at the data and start small. Because I think all too often people get stuck in the, well, I have to go solve every single piece of this. And actually what we're encouraging people to do is let's look at the information together and start. I think the other thing we underestimate is people. And certainly our employees, I'm sure PECA's employees are incredibly passionate about this topic. And so when we look at our own facilities, our own factories, many of the best ideas we get are from our people and they expect us as a corporation to actually live by what we say um, and to do that not only with our clients, but in our own facilities. And so empowering your people to have a part in solving this, um, we found has worked quite well for us. Mm. Can, I, can I? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to build on, build on that, what, what we will need is uh, a massive electrification of our society. If, if, if I remember right, it's roughly 
25 percent, 20 to 25 percent of the the final energy consumption in the world is currently taking place in, as electricity. Hmm. The rest is in other other forms. Only 20 to 25 percent. And what we are going to need to do if we want to get to uh, to uh, climate uh, to net zero, we need to electrify our heating systems. But even more importantly, we need to electrify transportation and we need to electrify significant industrial processes. Mm. And some of them are really, really hard mm. because they are all relying on fossil fuels, uh, steel making. The world is dependent on steel. Uh, cement is even more uh, difficult. The uh, world is relying on steel and cement as construction materials, uh, aluminium. And all of this needs to be electrified. And if, if and when we do this, this is the only way to reduce those significant emission sources that, that there are. And if we do this, this will mean that, that our electricity consumption, even in Europe, will double or even triple in the next 20 to 30 uh, years. And that two to three times higher electricity consumption needs to be CO2 free. Mm -hmm. So this is a massive systemic challenge that we are facing. It absolutely is. And Kelly, yeah. could you unpack this a little bit for us? There's this huge challenge that, that, that Pekka articulated there. What, what, are the, the, what is the role of smart energy technology in, in meeting that challenge? Could you sort of give us some examples? Well, I think, you know, one of the biggest things that I was going to say in response to Pekka is we talk a lot about new construction. There's regulations aligned with new construction. How do you meet different ratings based on different governments around the world? But what we're not talking enough about is existing buildings and processes, right. which account for more than 70% of what we're talking about here. And there's very little regulation in most parts of the world around how do you do that? Everything from your home mm -hmm. all the way to a cement plant or a data center or a commercial building. And, and that is what we have to attack. And I think with policymakers and companies and governments together, we've got to start talking about um, the buildings that already exist yeah. and the facilities and the infrastructure that already exists, because it's not just about what's going to come. It's about what we've all been building over the last many years. And how do you make that greener? How do you use less of that? Um, to Pekka's earlier point, how do you take in the UK gas boilers and, put, and move them into electric heat pumps? That, that is where we're going to have to go. But yeah. we've got to move down that path and have those discussions. And the role of smart energy tech in that? Smart meters, for example, and others? Yeah, I mean, smart meters give you uh, much more detail about what each process is using or each sub area of a building is really what a smart meter does. And so it's incredibly effective if you want to narrow down um, what does this auditorium use or what does the kitchen in this building use? And then how do you apply a process and a technology to a specific area and a use um, of the area? Mm. Fantastic. The, 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 the whole electricity system becomes two directional, exactly as you said, and the smart meters are a key enabler uh, of that because I mean, the challenge in the whole system will be that, that uh, when we are all the time adding uh, weather dependent intermittent uh, uh, solar and wind, it gets harder and harder to maintain the frequency uh, mm. of the system because in electricity, demand and supply needs to be in balance every, mm. every second. So we are going to need a lot of smart digital technologies mm -hmm. also on the demand side of the equation mm -hmm. because we need, un unless we get really, really good innovations in storage. The reality is that if we want to get rid of all emissions in the electricity system, we need extremely flexible demand side mm. of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the system. Otherwise it will simply not work yeah. because the, I mean, you have a lot of wind power here in Scotland. We're building offshore wind farms here, but uh, what, when, what happens when, when there is no wind? So digitalization can clearly play a massively important enabling role um, Pekka, we know from Nokia's own research that only 30% of industry has digitalized. Mm. So there's a huge opportunity to do more. Um, but we know many companies don't even know where to get started with this. What's your advice to them? Probably the first thing to realize is, is that I, I, I think that most companies start to understand this now is that, that digitalization is really, it's not an IT question. It's a strategic question and it is a management team question, it needs to be led by the uh, by CEO or at least uh, sponsored uh, by the uh, CEO. It's a business transformation question. You need to set bold 
targets and uh, and make it sure that everybody understands that we need to transfer our our business models when you when i mean it's big thing when i mean i mentioned farming mm -hmm. already when you look at the realities of a farm today it's quite a leap from there to to, mm -hmm. to get to fully fully digital the reality in a steel mill mm -hmm. when you go there and, and 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 talk to the decision makers there that hey you need to do this and this and this and this these are big things digitalization in in most companies so far has been led by cio and it has meant the digitalization and implementation of the the administrational and financial and office systems which are now increasingly delivered through cloud and then it moved to supply chain management systems sap's and so on but what is almost completely untapped today still is the digitalization of the operational technology mm -hmm. all the industrial control systems that control all the machines in workshops and in power plants and uh, so on. The next thing that will happen is that these uh, uh, machines and the data that they produce will also go into cloud. And the massive amount of data that they produced will be crunched by artificial intelligence. And that will be used to significantly improve the productivity of these uh, processes. Mm. But this is not an IT question. This is an operational question for these industries. And this is the dilemma that, that many companies will be facing, that how, how do you bridge from this traditional IT thinking mm. to the very different world of running machines in a workshop? Mm. Absolutely. Uh, Kelly, did you want to respond to that? No, I think you're exactly right. We do mm. a lot of business with data centers. As an example, obviously, the, you know, the entities that are powering all of our phones and everything Pekka makes and... And, um, and they have a huge challenge ahead of them because the demand for data and the speed at which we're all requiring it is nonstop at this point. And so what does that mean? It means you have to build the infrastructure associated with that for, your, for our phones and our computers and, and our smart houses and all of these things to run now. And yet at the same time, they, they're using a lot of energy. Mm. Um, and, and this is where I think you start to see this public-private partnership component as well. You'll see a lot of the big tech companies now saying, we're going to build wind farms. We're going to invest in solar because they're they're offsetting um, what they're contributing into the environment. And so there's um, it, it's a it's a kind of a constantly evolving topic. Quite frankly, as we all want more information and more data and more technology, and how do we all solve that mm. in real time? Yeah, um, manufacturing is obviously a big user of, mm. of energy. Um, and uh, research suggests that only 1% of factories use smart technologies right now. Which smart connected technologies do you think have the most potential to rapidly cut emissions from that sector over the next decade? So I think a lot of this around smart factories um, relates back to what we were both saying before, which is around process. You know, a, a factory is a whole bunch of processes put together and a whole bunch of products that are put together. And so Schneider has been in this process over the last 15 years of making our own factory smart. And we've made a lot of progress. We've cut about 20% of the emissions associated with all of our factories globally. And this comes down to what's the paint cycle process look like and how do I use less energy? What's the packing process look like? What's the robot doing? And actually tackling it in sort of each of those sub areas, because the technologies are very specific to what a process is doing. You know, what Schneider does in a factory um, is going to be really different than what a cement factory does yeah. in terms of reducing their usage. But it goes back to ultimately, is the process smart? Um, is the technology smart? And actually, are you only running when you need to? Mm. You know, you can use things like smart meters, as you said, to figure out, do I actually need to start up that machine three hours before I start production? Maybe I only need to start it up an hour before I start production, and I'm going to save those two hours. And that's what we're asking, and that's what mm. I think everybody in the manufacturing world is asking of themselves. Mm. Yeah, mm. Absolutely. Uh, Pekka, Nokia has obviously developed its own smart factory mm. uh, in Finland. Could you tell us a little about that? And what it involves well that that's uh, that's a site that we in a way use as a demonstration site okay. for what the smart factory can be and uh, you will not be surprised to hear that there is a a a, a 5g wireless uh, wireless network then there is a, a edge cloud that is uh, that is providing the data data center uh, capacity uh, we are working on digital twins uh, high degree of iot uh, utilization uh, analytics uh, we've been able to significantly 
improve uh, productivity mm. uh, with the installation of the latest uh, technologies. Thirty um, percent productivity gain in in, in a few years uh, is actually quite uh, quite a lot. Fifty uh, percent mm. savings in uh, time to market, um, and uh, and uh, of course uh, when you connect this then to the demand supply planning systems and all the way to the material flow, mm. you are you have taken quite important uh, uh, steps. This this potential is massive. Uh, it needs to be tapped into it. It's a big business opportunity, of course, for us. Mm. But exactly as you said, I mean, all these manufacturing sites, industrial campuses in this world, we estimate that there's 15 million of these industrial campuses of this world. So somebody will need to go to these places and sell and implement all these digital digital systems and uh, the research that uh, that you, you referred to mm. it's actually eye opening that mm. that only was it one point something percent of, yeah. of of this uh, industrial campuses are digital mm. truly digital mm. today and then there was this forecast that this may go to six percent by 2030 six percent too little but it needs to go much higher yeah, yeah. well i think simon yeah. you know it takes companies like nokia and schneider to sit down and help Mm. because we've done, you know, on our own factories, and this is a constantly improving um, opportunity as technology comes, but what we've recently launched is with our top 1,000 suppliers to mm -hmm. say, we will help get you towards net zero by 2050. Now, mm. we could argue, is that is that ambitious enough from a mm. time perspective? But we have to, to, we have to get those top 1,000 suppliers moving in mm. the right direction. Um, and that includes everything from electronics and components to packaging and you know, everything that helps get, get, to, get a product out the door. But it takes, I think, big companies to help a lot of their suppliers right. to really get in that right mindset that says, if you want to do business with Schneider Electric, ultimately, you're going to go down this path and you're, you know, you're going to go green, if you will. I think that's right. And Carbon Trust has certainly found it very helpful to work with uh, whole supply chains in order mm -hmm. to drive transformational change. And we're big believers in that. Um, we know there are huge benefits from uh, existing uh, digital technologies in, in relation to the low carbon transition, um, Pekka, but we also know there's a role for innovation. Uh, Nokia has a long uh, uh, tradition and history of, of investing in innovation. What climate innovation is Nokia currently focused on um, and how do you see it supporting the net zero economy? If we, if we talk about the things that have the biggest impact, I would, uh, like to mention the the silicon and chipset innovation that is driving down electricity consumption in the in the uh, in the telecom mobile or fixed uh, fixed network and there's actually some very interesting interesting innovation there from from our point of view when we look at our emissions we of course not only include scope one and scope two but but very much scope three uh, electricity is one of the biggest cost items for for telecom operators so when the data traffic is, is continuously growing almost expen exponentially, the, the electricity consumption per bit needs to be driven down uh, aggressively. And with our latest generation of chipset, it goes down 75%, mm. which, is, uh, which is pretty good achievement. 90% of our total emissions are scope three. So if we want to really make our own value mm. chain, I mean, not talking about the impact we might may, may make to physical industries, mm -hmm. that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. But our direct value mm -hmm. chain from our sourcing all the way to our operator customers using electricity, mm -hmm. we need to help them drive down their electricity consumption. Absolutely. Um, and, and Kelly, what's your take on or, or, or sense of the importance of innovation in, in driving this? Is it, is it mostly about deployment of existing technologies in this sector or? Are you still hopeful that innovation can I, I help think, too? I think it has to be both. Yeah. I think we have a lot of the technologies today, and it goes back to, I guess, the, the previous session, the blah, blah, blah. And look, we have a lot of it today, and, and people aren't using it, and people aren't thinking forward enough, and they aren't implementing. Um, and then it's also going to be about innovation. You know, Schneider mm. is a company for a long time, you would have thought innovation was only done internally. But in the last five years, we have really expanded our thinking around that because there are smart people everywhere mm. and there are smart people working on the climate everywhere. And how does Schneider as a company work alongside them actually to, to 
think through those big innovations and what's next. And so we've, you know, set up venture funds. We work quite closely with a lot of startup communities around the world because entrepreneurs have tremendous ideas. And once again, big companies like ours have also the opportunity to say, oh, we see how that, uh, that innovation actually fits into what we're doing today. It could accelerate where we are. Mm. Um, and so it's a balance mm -hmm. actually um, from what we have today, but also what certainly innovation mm. will continue to bring. Mm -hmm. um, Kelly, you know, we look at the, the potential, we've seen the scale of the challenge in some of the comments that both of you have made in terms of uh, uh, sectors that still haven't gone digital. There's a huge amount of investment required clearly. Mm. Uh, to make this happen in potentially in, in expensive infrastructure. Could that be a barrier or do you feel there are short term paybacks here that mean it's fairly attractive to invest in this sort of thing? I think it's both. So I think all of the governments post largest governments of the world post COVID have um, certainly announced huge investment packages, much of which is around green. The UK itself has you know, more than a two trillion package and it's all about green infrastructure and, mm. and how to move forward. And so we're very excited about that because we think it means the government is, is clearly sort of um, investing in what they've been saying as well. Um, however, you can't just wait for the governments to sort mm. of drive this. Their job is to set policy and to mm -hmm. help set direction and to some extent help set vision. And then you need all of us and, and many others to every day be tackling the problem and go after. Um, you know, we do think there's probably more room for regulation and mm -hmm. drive behind standards much mm -hmm. more clearly with a lot of the different governments. Because then, because to Pekka's point earlier, if you want to hit the one and a half degrees, what is that tipping point for, mm -hmm. for some people? Mm -hmm. we're, we're working on it, you know, no doubt Nokia is working on it, as are a lot of other places, but, but everybody isn't and we know that. And so how do we force that? Um, to move forward because it's it's about the future of the planet and and so we you know we have we come back to really the big picture here um, that's critical absolutely and and Pekka you touched on some of this earlier but you know if you could you could address the uh, uh, united uh, governments of, uh, that, that were gathering here a couple of days ago um, and and send a message to them um, about the sort of policies needed to make this. Uh, smart energy system happen, what would you say was at the top of your list? What would be the most important things that they should be putting in place to make this a possibility? To, 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 to my taste, there is, there is too much subsidies and, and politician-driven spending versus creating smart regulation that would take advantage of the market mechanisms to attract private capital because we Perhaps not everybody, but I guess many, many will agree that, that the private sector is much more efficient in allocating capital in the most efficient uh, uh, way than, uh, than the public uh, sector. So rather than increasing uh, sub subsidies for green digital, I go back to what I said uh, earlier. We need, we, we need smart market-based regulation and binding, binding legislation that limits emissions and forces them to go down uh, and that's why i used the european emission trading system as an example it needs to be binding it needs to be legislation and then you let the markets fight for those all the time reducing uh, emission rights um, in the best possible way that they can i think i personally think think that this is this would be the only way to even have a theoretical chance to have our emissions in the 2020s. Kelly, would you agree? Um, I think binding is important. I would definitely agree there. Um, and I think it's how do we actually make people see that they can contribute? Mm. Because sometimes you put a big problem on the table and people go, well, that's for Pekka to solve. Mm. And actually it's for all of us to solve. Yeah. And so how do we do that together? Mm. Um, and, and I think it's got to all work in conjunction, um, governments, public, private citizens saying this matters and it's important. Fantastic. We're out of time, sadly. Kelly, Pekka, thank you very much for your stimulating thoughts and contributions to this really important debate here in Glasgow COP26. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that concludes this afternoon's event in Glasgow. I hope you've enjoyed it and it's proven insightful.
encouraging and hopeful in terms of what the mobile industry is doing in order to work towards net zero by 2050. I'd like to thank everyone who's taken part today, Matt Granrid, uh, the Director General of GSMA, Dr. Paul Ryu of SK Telecom, Andy Wales from the BT Group, Matt Pellback sharp from Ericsson, Dexter Galvin from CDP, Pekka Lundmark from Nokia, Kelly Becker from Schneider Electric, and Simon Retallick from the Carbon Trust. Thank you for moderating that Pleasure. session. And thank you too to GSMA for organizing the sessions. And if you'd like any more information, please go to gsma.com forward slash climate. Uh, I'm Sue Nelson. Thank you for joining us both online and in person here at the Kelvin Hall at Glasgow University. I hope you'll enjoy the opportunity to continue discussions over refreshments. Thank you and goodbye.